Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the first document we're going to look at this afternoon is poll 00118496, please. Uh, this is a note, a file note, um, from Paul of Ennels, dated the 26th of July 2013, uh, and it relates to a conversation that she had with you on the 24th of July. Um, I'm going to spend a bit of time on this document, and I'll take you through some of the key paragraphs in this file note. Um, she says, purpose, to make clear to Susan that she's accountable for the process going forwards, and that there are three areas of concern uh, that I have going away on leave, and also in order to protect the business as much as possible, uh, to reassure her that I believe she can do it, do this, uh, in order to give her the confidence to do so and to avoid any misunderstanding or possible demotivation in the process. Um, what was your understanding of the purpose uh, of the meeting? I can't remember. It might have been our first one-to-one -one after the issue of the report, but I'm... I'm not sure. I mean, we've seen the board minutes and concerns raised at board level. Mm. Um, was this the first opportunity to discuss what happened at the board with Paul of Ennels? Th that would be my recollection, yes. And what did you understand by protecting the business? Was that something that she brought up with you? Yes, she did. I think she felt that... I think what I understood her to say was that she felt that the second site report could have been very damaging for the business. She says, I asked Susan how she felt the meeting with Alistair Marnock, chair of the Audit and Risk Committee, had gone. Uh, she thought he had understood and was supportive of the process. I confirmed that was the case and that he was particularly reassured uh, that we had the legal and independence aspect covered. I also said that I now had two or three conversations with the chairman who, although she was still very concerned about the whole issue, was more reassured that we're taking the right approach, which included Susan seeing this through. I suggested that Susan should see Alice. Susan informed me uh, that she had already secured a date next Thursday, the 31st of July. Um, can you assist us with what the purpose of the meeting with Alistair Marnock was? So he, he had been tasked, or he might have volunteered, I don't know, he was the chair of um, the Audit and Risk Committee, to come and meet with Olwen and I to take, so that we could take him through the process that we were going through, or I could take him through the process we were going through, as I hadn't had an opportunity to do that at the board meeting. Can I just add that I hadn't seen the minutes of the meeting either, so I didn't understand um, what had been said at the meeting. I was also keen to understand that in case some issues rising from that that I needed to know about. So you hadn't been invited into the meeting uh, and you hadn't seen the minutes of the meeting uh, and we're now 26th of July um, was that a surprise to you yes um, it says Alice Perkins was very concerned were you aware that she was very concerned and um, what if so what were you aware of I think I knew she was concerned but I didn't particularly know why because I felt that I delivered on what she'd asked me to do at least you know we'd got to the interim report stage um, so I didn't really understand why and I did think I had to meet her and talk to her um, and I was very concerned that, that you know following standing outside the board meeting for an hour you know where on earth do you go from here the note says I outlined three concerns that I would want Susan to be clear about and have actions in place to deal with the first is costs the second is delivery of work in progress. It says, uh, Susan felt Angela and her close uh, working... Uh, uh, sorry, Susan felt that, that via Angela and her close working with Second Sight, uh, we should be able to manage the above two points. Her concern centred on the Justice for Subpostmasters Alliance and keeping them uh, to any approach agreed. My observation to her was that Alan Bates will be subject to the same pressures as George Thompson. Uh, Alan Bates slash George Thompson agree a sensible way forward, uh, but when they go back to their members, they're accused of going native and then sent back with different and usually more extreme requests. The only way around this is to stay very close to Alan Bates 
to be in touch once or twice a week to check he has the support he needs and to listen out for any concerns that may be building. Um, can you assist us with that paragraph and what was being uh, suggested there? So I would say that um, the post has developed a very close relationship with George Thompson, who is the Federation of the National Fo Federation of Sub Postmasters, and she was suggesting that I should develop the same kind of relationship with Alan Bates, um, which I didn't have any, any issue with developing that relationship, but I felt it had to have a purpose. If, if we scroll down the page, uh, another one of the objectives, it relates to the JFSA. Uh, and then it says as follows, Susan was initially frosty in her manner. She's clearly feeling the pressure, which is understandable. I hope that I reassured her, and within a few minutes we were talking normally. She relaxed and we had a useful conversation, as noted above. Uh, is that an accurate description uh, of you on that occasion? I, I certainly, I think I would have been frosty, yes, given the board meeting issue. And I think I was concerned about my position vis-a-vis -vis the board. Um, probably I would have been talking no normally because I don't, that would be my normal way I'd behave. She says, I remain concerned that Susan is not organised or structured, nor is she a leader. Uh, these gaps in her capability are risks to the business. They're being dealt with by supporting her with individuals who are organised and structured and by a process to monitor. Uh, she remains a good advisor. I will review the longer term decision in September. Um, does that accord with your recollection of the discussions with Paula Venels on this occasion? She didn't mention those things to me. No. And what is your feeling about what's said there? I, I suppose I would disagree with those, and I think my career demonstrates that, that <coughs> that's not the case. Were you aware that your future was going to be determined in September? Or reviewed in September? Not at that time, although when I reflect on it, it's not entirely unsurprising. We know that you received the Clark advice relating to Gareth Jenkins on the 17th of July. We're now on the 26th of July. There doesn't seem to be a mention in this email of concerns about historic uh, and uh, even ongoing criminal cases. Why is that? I think because that was the role that Alistair Marnock was taking. So part of, <coughs> excuse me, part of our discussions was to go through the, um, the review process that Cartwright King and to explain why we were doing it and what we were doing. At least that's what I remember us doing. We spent quite a bit of time on that. Uh, so was it not your responsibility to draw that advice to Paula Venels' attention? I think I had flagged it to her. I just can't quite remember when. Would it be around that time? I would have thought so. I think, yeah. yeah. It, sh it would have been part of the discussion around the Cartwright Queen King review and why they're doing and what they had to disclose and why they had to disclose it. Is it surprising, though, that on the 26th of July that you had a meeting with the CEO and no concerns are raised in that meeting about the safety of convictions, for example. I think I had, I had done that with Alistair Marnock, so she would have had that call, and he did a note. I think it is surprising, yes, in retrospect. So it's surprising, but you thought that it was being taken forward by Alistair Marnock? Yeah, and if you go back to my recommendation in the board paper, I think that asked for the ARC to review the pol prosecution's policy, I think. It was in one of the drafts anyway, in September, a part of the ARC meeting. Do you think that that lacked some urgency, given the advice from Simon Clark? Probably, yes. But, but we, were then doing the, um, we were then doing the disclosure, and also I had asked that prosecutions be ceased, but I hadn't officially, I hadn't, I'd asked that they would be reviewed as per the post-separation issues. But they were continuing? As far as I was aware, yes. Can we look at poll 00006590, please? This is a document 
of the 28th of July 2013, sorry, 26th of July 2013, uh, and it's entitled Update on the Work Programme Arising from the Horizon Report. Um, so that was produced, I think, on the same day as your meeting with Paul of Ennels. Sorry, the same day as the email note from Paul of Ennels, two days after your meeting. Um, do you know who drafted this document? I don't know who drafted it. Um, we will see somewhere there's an email chain where it's sent by Paula Venels. Um, would it surprise you if Paula Venels herself drafted this? No, it, it wouldn't surprise me, no. On page one, um, you hadn't been asked to pro provide or produce a document like this. I, I don't think so. Because we saw in the board minutes that there was a request for the up, an update on the work. Yes. Um, but that was, a, as we've heard, a meeting that you weren't in attendance. No. Um, page one. Further to the board discussion on the 16th of July, this note provides an update on how we're taking forward the programme of work in response to the publication of the second site report. Uh, now, given that you had actually produced the note for the board for the 16th of July, um, and were due to speak to that. Is it surprising, or were you surprised, uh, that an update was being provided by somebody other than you? I am I'm surprised, but I can't, I can't remember writing this all. It's not, it's not the way, it's not my typeface. But I, yeah. So yes, I, think, I don't think I did it, and, I, and it is surprising to me, but I can't remember. Um, if we scroll down the page, Point four, we've been focusing on developing an approach to respond uh, to these expectations, which balances the requirements to be cost effective, time efficient, and credible. Two specific concerns about Second Sight. First, as a two man team, they don't have the capacity to deal with all of these cases within an acceptable time scale. And secondly, their approach of seeking to reconcile the conflicting evidence and views of the post office and sub postmasters, which stems from a steer from James Arbuthnot that they needed to keep the JFSA on side, is pushing them into an almost impossible situation, which both extends the time taken to conclude each case and, more worryingly, creates a tendency for them to place greater weight on the sub postmasters' version of events, irrespective of the evidence we present. Was that a view that you were aware of? No, I don't think I was. I can't remember being aware of that view. I, didn't, I don't remember that there was the concept that it was irreconcilable. I thought it was a question of them stating their, their case. Were you aware of a concern in the business at this time that uh, Second Sight were tending to place greater weight on the sub-postmaster's version of events? Possibly within the business, but it wasn't a concern that I shared, I don't think. We propose to address these concerns through two specific measures. The first, restricting Second Sight to remit to the specific task of preparing an impartial evidence base and over the page, changing the way we work with Second Sight by allocating additional senior level resource with a deep understanding of the network to work closely alongside them in order to answer their queries and help them prepare as accurate an evidence base as quickly and efficiently as possible. If we move on, please, to the 26th of July, can we look at poll 00297994? It's around this time there's an email discussion about the board's own potential liabilities um, raised at a 23rd of July board meeting. This is an email to yourself from the head of corporate finance, um, and he provides a suggested response uh, to a question raised at the 23rd of July board meeting. Uh, the board requests further clarification on their position as directors. In summary, is it highly unlikely that any individual director would have any personal liability in connection with this review unless they had acted in bad faith or maliciously? Uh, in the unlikely event that an action is brought, could only be by post office limited or in very rare circumstances by the shareholder acting on behalf of the company. Uh, there is insurance cover in place to cover directors, etc. Was there, were you aware of a concern at board level about their own personal liability? 
I think that's been fed back to me as one of the questions raised by the board to be covered off in this paper, which is why I talked to Charles Colquhoun about it or asked him for his view on the policy. And was your impression of uh, the board or the executive at this time one of concern about their own personal liability? I think possibly at the board level, because that was the feed, that was the, what was fed back to me from the board meeting. Does anything stick out in your memory in that respect? N no, I don't think so. Um, you then have a meeting with Susan Crichton. Can we please look at poll 00381455, please? Sorry, with Alice Perkins. <coughs> AP meeting with Susan Crichton, 31st of July at 148 Old Street. Um, again, this is another note that I think I'm going to have to take you to in quite a lot of detail. Um, she begins the note saying, I opened by saying that I had wanted the meeting because I felt uncomfortable about the fact that Susan Crichton and I had not had a conversation since the second site interim report had been published a few weeks ago. I had not wanted to go on my holiday without talking to her. Um, I first asked about her health, as the last time I had seen her on her own before the June board away day, as she had been unwell. Um, are we to read anything in, into that? Were you feeling unwell as a result of your work, or was it entirely unconnected? I think where, where, where I come out to it on reflection is it was actually making me quite ill. says that you were very cool in your manner at the outset. Uh, you had a number of questions uh, which you wanted to ask. Uh, you started to write down what she was saying in, her no in your notebook, uh, and she remarked that it seemed as though you were turning it into, into something very formal, which was not what she had in mind. Uh, she wanted to talk to you about how you were and how you felt about things. Um, is that an accurate reflection of what occurred at the beginning of that meeting? I can't recall that, but it could have been. Uh, it then goes on to say, she said she'd been very unhappy about being kept outside the board meeting for an hour and then told her presence was not required. She said she was not prepared to be treated as a scapegoat. Why were you concerned about being treated as a scapegoat? So I felt um, at the time as if I had delivered on what she'd requested, albeit as by the interim report, that I hadn't been allowed to go and explain to the board my position and kept outside, and I didn't have another channel to talk to the board. Um, and you'll see later that I think I make clear that as a general counsel, you can't operate in a business if you don't have the support of the chair, the board, and the CEO. And how were they going to treat you as a scapegoat? So my view was that within the board context, I, I suspected, because I didn't know, that the chair had not been clear and it was her instructions that we instituted the second site review on the basis that we did, as in an independent review. And if it was an independent review, then that's what it had to be, an independent review. It says, I said that I hoped she knew me and the board well enough to know that we were not interested in finding scapegoats. Uh, that was not my approach and no one had in mind to make her into one. I apologise for the fact that she must have felt uncomfortable outside of the boardroom and explained that after Paula Venels had, at my request, introduced the agenda item on Second Sight privately, the discussion had developed quickly and it had not been appropriate at any point to bring her in. So the suggestion seems to be um, that she had requested the CEO to introduce the item and that there hadn't been, uh, it went quickly and it hadn't been appropriate to bring you in. What was your reaction to being told that? I said that I, I thought that was not appropriate. I, you know, I said that if you, it was a significant piece of, um, should be a significant, in, I think what I said, something along the lines of, it was a significant issue for the board and there should have been a full discussion and I should have been there to explain um, how I, my views on the issues in front of the board. 
the agenda had been really packed, partly because we had to add this piece of business, and I had decided that once the board's private discussion was over, there was no time to pursue the conversation further with yourself. Um, did you believe that? Well, it's what, it's what she said at the time. But no, I didn't necessarily believe it because I knew it was on the agenda. And we also saw that you were, had been due to talk about another item on the agenda. Later in the, yes, on the corporate restructure. And to your recollection, uh, am I right in saying you don't believe that you at any point entered the room? No. It would have been very difficult for me to go in and talk about the corporate restructure after not coming in to talk about the second site report. I had realised that that would be difficult for her. Uh, she said that she needed to know that uh, she had the full confidence of the board. No one had told her what had been said at the board, though she understood that there had been some difficult questions, especially from VH. Is that Virginia Holmes? Yes. And she was a non-executive director? Yes. Um, why do you think there were some difficult questions from Virginia Holmes? I think Alman probably told me that. Um, it didn't so, really give me any detail. Uh, so you did have a, a line and into the board from Alwyn Lyons in terms yes. of feeding back what had happened? Well, only at a very high level. And what had Alwyn said about Virginia Holmes? I can't remember now, I'm sorry. Um, did you get on with Miss Holmes? Uh, it was a professional relationship. Do you have any concerns about her? No, I didn't really know her that well. She hadn't been on the board for that long, I don't think. It says that your reputation was at stake. Were you concerned about your reputation? I, I, I felt that it was important as an in-house lawyer that you were able to behave in a way that had integrity and having been tasked with delivering an independent report then that's what you should do. It says, I said that the second site interim report and the timing of its publication had been potentially very serious indeed for the post office in terms of our national reputation and the effect it could have on our funding negotiations with government. In the event, it had not come out so badly, partly because of the way the minister had handled her statement in the House of Commons, but it had been very worrying at the time. Can you assist us with that paragraph, please? So I think as part of the um, James Arbuthnot uh, discussion, he'd asked Joe Swinton, I think, who was the minister at the time, to go before the House of Commons, and he'd asked a, a parliamentary question that she had to answer, from memory. Yes. And in terms of funding negotiations with the government, what were the concerns there? I can't remember where we were in the funding cycle, but Postvis relied for funding on the government. And it, it may be, I'm not completely clear on this, that we had a one year, we had maybe had a one or two year funding agreement as part of the separation from Royal Mail Group, but I really can't remember. It would seem strange that we'd become independent with only a two year funding arrangement, but I, I can't remember, I'm afraid. It then says, the board had been unsighted on the issue. They had naturally been alarmed when they had found out what had happened, and the fact that the board paper had been so bland had not helped to build their confidence in the handling of the affair. Uh, there had been the possibility of a discussion on a board call the previous week, but because we had needed to discuss issues in relation to the strategy and funding negotiations with the government, which required board decisions, these had had to come first, and we had run out of time for the second site issue before people had to leave the call. Uh, in the course of what followed, the following points were made. Um, you said that you now thought it had been right to have the inquiry, as it revealed the imbalance of power between the post office and sub-postmasters, which needs addressing. Uh, this was a huge and complex issue for the business. Can you assist us with the words there and what it was that you said? I think was it as part of the work the Second Sight did, it really brought it home to me and I'd already had a discussion with the team as part of our review of the post-office contract some time previous to this um, that we needed to look at the contract 
to uh, redress the balance. I likened it, because of my background, to a consumer contract with a large corporate. Um, and that was borne out by certainly the feedback I'd got from Second Sight. But this was a fundamental issue for the business that they needed to address. And the note continues, I commented that I thought that although the outcome had in some ways been good for the post office, the way the process had been handled had been deeply flawed. I had backed your judgment on the appointment of Second Sight uh, because we did not want to appoint one of the big four. Uh, you seemed very confident in them and given your strongly stated opinion to having an inquiry in the first place, she had wanted to feel some ownership I wanted you to feel some ownership of the process uh, once we had decided to go down that route. We had lost control of the process. I had lost confidence with Simon Baker early on, but had been told repeatedly that he was good and capable of handling the role. I said that we should never have got into a position where we did not see the draft second site report until days before its publication. So pausing there, it very much seems as though you're being blamed in that paragraph. It feels like it, yes. And, and I think with regard to Second Sight, I hope I've made it clear that although I, I knew Ron Warmington, you know, we were not friends, and I very deliberately, I think, stepped out of the selection process and allowed them to talk to um, Alice Perkins and Paula Venables themselves because it was key to me that both, both parties... Um, accepted what they were getting into at that point, as in a proper independent investigation. Was it your strongly stated opinion that there should be an inquiry in the first place? Yes, it was. Uh, and were you a sole voice in that? It felt a bit like it at times, yes. It continues, I understood that Second Sight's investigation had to be independent, but in the civil service there would have been someone marking it who was close to all the key people, Second Sight, James Arbuthnot, Justice for Sub-Postmasters Alliance, and knew what was going on between them. By the time I'd find out how Second Sight had, in effect, changed the terms of reference to which they were working, it was too late to retrieve the situation. The organisation and people in it should have had proper time to consider Second Sight's findings and respond to them. Uh, says that you questioned her understanding of the end game and said that post office had seen the report days earlier. You had been contacted by the CEO whilst you were unwell about this and had come back early from your holiday to handle it, which had not been ideal. Can you assist us with the reference to the civil service? There would have been someone marking it who was close to all the key people. I mean, I don't remember this, this part of the conversation specifically, but I assumed what she was talking about was that um, in the civil service, of which I had no experience, um, there would have been a level of control over the report that I hadn't exercised. Is it a suggestion that although it would have been an independent report, there would have been some influence by those who are being investigated? Yes, I think that's probably right. That's what, that's what I understand this sentence or this, these paragraphs to say. Is that under, how you understood the conversation at the time? I think so, yes. I think it was. It says that you said that as a lawyer, it's inappropriate for you to influence the key stakeholders. Uh, you would have been criticised had you become close to them. And uh, Ms Perkins commented that if you had felt unable to play that role... You should have flagged it up and someone else could have been brought in to perform it. Uh, privately, I'm astonished at this view, which I simply do not recognise from my experience elsewhere. Um, did you and do you consider that it would be inappropriate to influence the key stakeholders? I think the role I was trying to play for post office was to be an independent intermediary so that Second Sight got the information in the form that they wanted it. I wasn't always successful, and certainly timing-wise, things took too long to do. Um, but that's what I believe my role was in this context. And analysing that paragraph, what do you recall of the conversation with Ms Perkins? I, I just... It was very frosty. 
I suppose I characterise it as being a very difficult conversation. It says that you said that you were in a difficult position now. You needed the board's full confidence because so many aspects of what you were being asked to do were beyond your control. Uh, she said that she realised she uh, couldn't control everything, but this was not like an unexpected meter exploding out of nowhere. Do, do you know what that meant? I think it might mean water. Water. Um, we needed to identify the worst things which could happen, face them and work out how we would mitigate them. We needed to stay close to the key players and ensure that they were building their trust and we knew what was going on between them. That would take time, but I did not accept the degree to which uh, you had claimed that they were beyond your control. They needed managing. I asked about Second Sight's role going forward and said I thought it was critical that we capped off their involvement uh, at the 47 cases already in the frame. We could not allow them to become involved in any additional cases as we would find it much harder to bring their involvement to an end. Uh, you said uh, that would be very difficult as James Arbuthnot and Justice for Sub-Postmasters Alliance rated them. Uh, she pointed out that uh, the post office did not. It was up to us to propose very quickly alternative arrangements going forward, uh, which would command the respect of James Arbuthnot and the Justice for Sub-Postmasters Alliance. Uh, we then talked about cost and the need to appoint any independent figures carefully and rigorously. If we go over the page, please. I think there's a paragraph there where um, I think you were critical of Simon Baker that he hadn't been of the right caliber. I thought Simon, Simon Baker did a really good job as a project manager, in, in retrospect. I, I don't think I would have said that. I think he, he was, you know, relatively senior in Leslie Saul's world, and he could sort of um, make up for my lack of technical expertise and knowing what to ask for and getting stuff done. And I think, I think that Second Sight appreciated that and thought he'd done a pretty good job. The problem was that there were too many well-paid people in the business not performing as they should be. I said uh, I had thought this issue was being tackled through more vigorous performance management, to which her reply was that she was not referring, she was referring to people below the senior leadership team. Can you assist us with who you were referring to, if that is an accurate description of what you were saying? I, I, don't think, I don't think it was an accurate description. Um, No, I, I, don't think I, I don't think I would have said that. Um, um, and I certainly can't specifically remember saying it. Um, it says, by the end of the conversation, uh, your tone was less formal and cool, uh, but her confidence in your judgment on key issues, and in particular, your fatalism, or reluctance to see the importance of managing events and people rather than standing back and letting them happen, were very troubling though I did not say, so in, say this in terms. Uh, I deliberately did not say anything about the board's or my confidence in her, and after the beginning of the conversation, she did not raise the point again. I did not explicitly raise the issue of the way Second Sight's costs have been allowed to spiral out of control, because I did not want the conversation to become the post-mortem, uh, and there were already enough issues on the table between us. Uh, P.S., at one point, uh, you referred to a recent conversation with the biz team at uh, which one of them had commented that they had always felt uncomfortable about the Horizon cases. Uh, when you had asked why they hadn't pursued that, the person had said it was because the post office had always been so forceful in its defence of the issue and its handling. Uh, are you able to assist us with that conversation uh, with the biz team? I'm really sorry, I can't remember it. Um, I worked closely with the BIS team throughout the state aid and the separation. I didn't have much conduct after that, so whether it was during that period, I don't know. Um, and I can't remember who it was who said that to me. Uh, who, who were the BIS team? So um, on the state aid, it was Will Gibson and there was somebody else who helped him. So. They would, be, they would have been my main points of contact. I'm afraid I can't remember his, his colleague's name. 
Um, I'm just going to take you back to your witness statement on the topic of this, this entire meeting and the meeting I've just shown you before with Paula Venels. Can we look at WITN 00220100? It's page 86. Thank you. Page 86. And there are some parts in your witness statement where you've addressed comments that have been made by Paula Vennels. If we scroll down, you say at paragraph 239, as to Ms. Vennels' comments in her emails to Ms. Perkins on the 26th of July 2013, I was not at the time aware of Ms. Vennels' criticism of me. And the next paragraph, as to whether I consider these criticisms to be fair, they were never communicated to me, and I do not consider them to be fair. Um, I have held a number of senior roles during my career, and these are not criticisms I have ever faced. And if we scroll down to 246 and 247, sorry, I said scroll up slightly. Thank you very much. Uh, regarding whether I was aware at the time of Ms. Venels and Ms. Perkins's criticisms, uh, I was not aware of them. In respect of whether I considered these criticisms to be fair, I refer to my explanation above. I was not aware of these criticisms at the time. They were not criticisms I had faced from colleagues before or since. Uh, we, we've just seen two file notes, one from Paula Venels, one from Alice Perkins. Uh, detailing meetings you had with them, at which they seem to have been quite blunt about uh, certain criticisms of the way that you approached things. Uh, do you think, looking back at your witness statement here, that's accurate? So obviously I hadn't seen those notes before I wrote this, and I suppose because they were talking about my lack of ability in organisation and as a leader, I wouldn't say that those two notes really addressed that. I would say that they, well, maybe organisation, I don't know, but that's not how I would necessarily characterise those notes. Um, now that I, when, you know, as I said, I didn't see them when I'd written the written statement. What your statement doesn't seem to do, though, is to give any idea of the strength of feeling that appears to have been present um, in the summer of 2013 between you and the senior leadership of the post office. So I think in relation to um, the chair, I make some reference to the relationship there and said it was cool or I can't remember exactly when I had a meeting with her and it was frosty because yeah. I didn't necessarily remember all the detail of that. I certainly remembered that I put to her the point about independence. Um, but the relationship was pretty bad by that stage, it seems. I think that's probably a fair summation of it, yes. But again, I had frankly, not forgotten it, but probably moved on from it. Um, can we please look at poll 00116114? This is the same, same day as that meeting. It's an email from Alice Perkins to a number of different recipients. is thanking Alwyn Lyons for the note. If we scroll down to page two, we can see Alwyn Lyons has sent an email saying, dear all, it's the bottom email there, please find attached a detailed note from Paula providing an update on our program of work in response to the Horizon investigation. And you recall I, I referred to that note, and we weren't sure who had drafted it. Is and that the note that was... A... I believe that is. Right. Um, would that surprise you? Uh, no, no, it wouldn't. I was just, you know... But if we scroll up, please. Page one. Miss Perkins is referring to the way forward board note on Horizon. She says, at first, while it's clear that we're committed to using Second Sight for the 47 cases, which are already in the frame for this review, it's extremely important that we cap their involvement at that. So that's something that was communicated to you on the same day. Second, we need to cap 
second site's costs. And, and then further down it says, finally, I've asked Susan to keep the board fully informed of future developments and to alert me to anything which she's unable to resolve, uh, which could get in the way of getting the job done in the way it needs to be done. She will be seeking conversations about all this with all the non-executive directors on an individual basis and will be in touch with you to arrange these. Um, why were you speaking or needing to speak to the non-executive directors at this stage? I presume she said that on the basis that I'd asked her if I had the confidence of the board. And so it was sort of, well, talk to them and find out. It was the sort and of impression I got. Did you talk to them and find out? From memory, I, well, I'd certainly spoken to Alistair Marnock. I can't remember about the others. And what impression do they give you about your future in the company? I just can't remember. I think I was sort of on the way to making my own decision, to be frank. Can we please look at poll 0145793? We're now on the 1st of August, so the next day. If we could start on the second page, please. There's an email from yourself to Paula Venels. And if we scroll down, that's the email. Um, you're providing some updates on the Horizon project. If we scroll down to second sight, you seem there to be putting into practice what uh, Alice Perkins had asked uh, regarding the 43, minimizing second sight's involvement, limiting costs, um, bringing in another company potentially, um, replacing second sight, will have to be carefully managed. And we plan on having a face-to-face -face meeting with Second Sight next week to discuss and agree a way forward. So it seems as though by that stage, you're getting quite clear directions on the future of Second Sight from yes, that's right. the chair. Correct. Uh, and you're putting them into action and emailing the CEO. I think we from memory we'd had a conversation about how to move I had a conversation with Second Sight about how to move forward from here or from you know the day before and how to work through the cases they've got but we were also thinking about putting in place the mediation scheme which eventually went into place and they remained a key part of that mediation scheme. Can we please turn to poll 00108058? This is the next day. An email from Paula Venels to Alice Perkins. Uh, if we scroll down to the bottom, please. Um, sh actually, if we scroll down over the page, Alice Perkins sends Teresa Isles a message saying, here is the document to which I was referring. I should be grateful if you could make sure Paula sees it on her return, but no need for her to see during her holiday. Please can you make sure no one else sees it? If we scroll up, it's her meeting note. Okay. Uh, well, if we scroll down, sorry, we can see the attachment at the bottom, and it's AP meeting with Susan Crichton, DocX. Um, the response from Paula Venels is on page one. The bottom of page one, please. It says, hi, Alice. Uh, Teresa confirmed it's on file. Thank you for doing the meeting and the note. It makes me sad, but doesn't surprise me. There are two alerts from me. The first is your point about the bland board paper. I've just seen a bland update from Susan on this week's work, which I've immediately sent on to Chris with some concerns about lack of progress. Some issues, second site costs and working party processes remaining the same as when I left last Wednesday slash Thursday, and no risks flagged at all. For example, there's no color on the fact that our external lawyers have issued disclosures on nine cases up from two weeks ago. Uh, the second alert is how much Susan sees as beyond her control, uh, one for my full return. I'll keep close to this and to Chris. Uh, who also is briefed to deal with second site cost issues. Uh, so reference there to the bland board paper. 
I mean, we've seen over the course of today um, board papers being changed, words being changed, uh, bugs being changed uh, to, to other words, um, the 5% issue, for example, um, going from 5 to 10% of cases going, that are going to be overturned to 5% uh, of cases where disclosure needed to be made. Uh, do you think that uh, you were producing bland board papers that didn't accurately set out the risks? Um, I don't think so. And certainly, as I mentioned, my intention would have been to have a better discussion about the risks face to face because at that stage, we weren't sure what the risks were. There was a sort of range of potential risks and outcomes from the actions we were having to take. And I would have preferred to discuss that range um, rather than just have it set out in a board paper. Um, I mean, we, we've talked about, for example, the Simon Clark advice on Gareth Jenkins. We're now in August 2013. Uh, don't you think you should have been jumping up and down a bit more about serious risks to the business, serious risks to the safety of convictions? With hindsight, probably. Yes, probably. I should have been. Paula Venel says to Alice Perkins, it makes me sad but doesn't surprise me. What's your view as to whether that was a genuine feeling or not? I have no idea. I'm going to take you to notes of some more meetings, but first I just want to look at some events that occurred around the same time. Can we begin with poll 00142323, please? And we're going back slightly in time to the 22nd of July, so a previous week or so. Um, this is an email from John Scott. I apologize for the formatting. Um, I think we do have other versions that don't have all the question marks, but you can take it from me that this is an email that was sent from John Scott to yourself, uh, Hugh Flemington, John L. Singh, and others. Uh, and he says as follows, <clears throat> a review has been conducted in respect of commercially sensitive and or legally privileged information, in particular with the management and exchange of information subject to the second site review. Whilst most information within this group will be legally privileged, nonetheless, if the information was to inadvertently be sent to the wrong email address or intercepted innocently or otherwise, uh, once out in the public domain, it will be hard to control. Having agreed with Susan Crichton, with immediate effect, all information should, where possible, be placed onto a document and access is through a password protocol. The procedure is easy to use and only takes a matter of seconds. Do you recall a discussion with uh, John Scott in around 22nd of July uh, relating to the protection of confidential and sensitive information? No, I don't. Do you think it's likely that it happened given that there is reference in that email to an agreement with you? Yes, I do think it's likely. And I was always of the view that um, if, if um, it made sense to use password protection, just to, to avoid, as he said, you know, it being inadvertently sent to the wrong person. Um, do you recall a, any conversation with John Scott around this time mm -hmm. about concerns relating to uh, the circulation of information relating to Horizon Matters? No, I don't think I do. There's mention there of the second site review. Why in particular did this concern relate to the second site review? I think it was more the general exchange of information. Can we look at poll 00006577? We're now on the 2nd of August. So a very similar time to when these conversations were taking place with Paula Venels and Alice Perkins. Uh, this is an email from, uh, a letter, sorry, from Andy Cash. Who was Andy Cash? So he was one of the lawyers at Cartwright King. Thank you. If we, if we can see there, it's dear Hugh and Susan. So you were one of the recipients for the urgent attention of Hugh Flemington and Susan Crichton. Um, he says as follows, I enclose for your urgent attention an advice prepared by my so colleague, Simon Clark. 
I'm sure you'll appreciate that the advice is sent as part of our brief to advise on the impact of horizon issues and to protect the reputation of the post office. It is fully accepted that you may wish to take a second opinion on the views expressed. Um, this is the Simon Clark advice on the duty to record information. Um, did you instruct Cartwright King to uh, provide that advice or was this something that was provided voluntarily? So I have a bit of problem with the chronology here. This, 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 this copy of this letter came in relatively late and I know there was quite a lot of discussion on the timing with one of my, pre one of my former colleagues last week. I don't remember seeing this in this form. I remember, I think I spoke to, late, later than the 2nd of August, I spoke to Martin Smith, I think. I think that's right. Right, so that's what it says in my statement, I think, um, in relation to the advice that was attached or enclosed with this letter. Um, we, let's look at the advice. It's poll 00006799. Do you recall receiving the advice? Yes, but again, I can't, I think probably after I'd had the telephone call from Cartwright King, I went off to try and find what had happened to the letter. And if we scroll down, please. Paragraph two says uh, as follows. Um, I advise that there ought to be a single central hub, the function of which was to act as the primary repository for all horizon issues. The hub would collate from all sources into one location, all Horizon-related defects, bugs, complaints, queries, and Fujitsu remedies, thereby providing a future expert witness and those charged with disclosure duties with recourse to a single information point where all Horizon issues could be identified and considered. The rationale behind this advice derived from the need to protect the post office from the current situation repeating itself in the future. The post office accepted that advice and according a weekly conference call meeting was established so as to meet the requirement of the central hub. Um, over the page, please. He says in paragraph five, um, at some point following the conclusion of the third conference call, which I understand to have taken place on the morning of Wednesday the 31st of July, it became unclear as to whether and what extent material was either being retained centrally or disseminated. Uh, the following information has been relayed to me. Uh, the minutes of a previous conference call had been typed and emailed to a number of persons, and instruction was then given that these, those emails and minutes should be and have been destroyed. The word shredded was conveyed to me. Handwritten minutes were not to be typed and should be forwarded to poll head of security. Uh, advice had been given to the post office, which I report as relayed to me verbatim. Um, if it's not minuted, it's not in the public domain and therefore not disclosable. If it's produced, it's available for disclosure. If not minuted, then technically it's not. If we sc scroll down slightly, it says some at the post office do not wish to minute the weekly conference calls. And then on page seven, he gives his advice or his conclusion. He says as follows, regardless of the position in civil law, any advice to the effect that if material is not minuted or otherwise written down, it does not fall to be disclosed is in the field of criminal law wrong. It is wrong in law and in principle and such a view represents a failing to fully appreciate the duties of fairness and integrity placed upon a prosecutor's shoulders. Now, there is a discussion by the 14th of August, 2013, with John Scott, and I'd like to look at that. It's poll 00139690. If we scroll down to the bottom of that page, please. Um, there's an email from you on the 13th of August about Wednesday call. John, as part of our remedial action, I had asked you to set up and chair this call. I have had very worrying feedback, re this call, from Cartwright King, and it sounds like this is not being chaired, the participants are unclear as to its purpose, and no minutes are being kept, or, is there, um, or there is confusion. 
Now, that certainly seems that by the 13th of August, you had considered the advice that I've just read. So, uh, from my memory, what happened is um, Jarnell and Hugh had had a conversation to say that the calls were being mismanaged and not achieving their objectives. And it may be at that point I went off to look for the advice, or I'd spoken to, to Martin. I don't think I'd seen the advice from Simon at that point, because if I had, I wouldn't have contacted John Scott in these terms, um, nor would I have suggested that he then carry on to chair the course, because that would be illogical. Illogical or wrong? Well, wrong, wrong. It'll be wrong. And how are you so confident, having not remembered detail of a number of meetings today, uh, that you didn't see that advice by the 13th of August? Well, it's just this is relatively late on the 13th. It's half past eight in the evening. I'm not completely confident. No, I wouldn't be completely confident, but that's how I think the logic worked. But I, you're right, I can't be completely confident. Because the covering letter to the advice of the 2nd of August, um, why does the, the timing, half past eight in the evening, mean because, that it's less likely that you saw the underlying advice? Because as I understood from the evidence that was given last week, I actually didn't get hold of the advice, the physical advice, as in, till the 14th of August. And then I wrote the letter to Cartwright King, which is also in the evidence. But you're right, I, I can't be completely certain. If we scroll up, please, we can read from this email. Um, it says, Susan, and this is from John Scott, the brief given by yourself for this meeting was to provide, in effect, an under-the-radar escalation point from across the business of issues that may impact the integrity of the Horizon system. You were frustrated in regards to production and circulation of the Helen Rose report and therefore did not want any electric, electronic communication uh, which may be subject to the Freedom of Information Act or disclosure. Um, is that right? No, that's not correct. And that's not the reason I was frustrated about the production of the Helen Rose report. I thought that the idea of having a conference call and a single hub um, was a very good idea, and we should have been doing it anyway. But what I did want was there to be one single repository of the data so that we had one version of what had been discussed, what had been agreed, and what remedies were going to take place so it was in one place and accessible. So I didn't, I didn't think it was made sense to have a lot of different emails flying around, but I wanted it in one place so that if Cartwright King needed to find it, it would be there. If Bond Dickinson needed it, if anybody needed it, it would be in one place and accessible and maintained because one of the issues with post office, as you've no doubt realised, is that the document retention issues are complex. So that's, that's what I wanted. Obviously, an, had this is a contemporaneous email. It's not a witness statement that's been written no. it, for the inquiry with hindsight. Um, a contemporaneous email that says very clearly that you were frustrated about the circulation of the Helen Rose report and you didn't want any electronic communication uh, which could be subject to disclosure. What, why would John Scott say that to you in an email? knowing that know. you could easily come back and say, what are you talking about? I don't know. Um, but the, the, the Helen Rose report was much more about how it was prepared, why it took so long, how it was disseminated to the criminal law team. Or it wasn't disseminated. That was a, a report that related to horizon integrity issues. Yes, the leptin. Um, I'll continue. The conference calls have been set up and they're chaired by a senior manager from the security team and then I'm briefed thereafter. I wasn't aware I had to specifically chair, uh, but that is easily remedied. At the outset, the purpose of the call was given and that this was an informal escalation point and no electronic notes would be taken or circulated and communication would created. Written notes uh, have been taken for each call and activity has been driven behind the scenes for example, a potential horizon glitch was raised uh, that had been reported previously to Simon Baker. 
This was then managed subsequently directly with Roderick Williams and Steve Beddow by myself in a manner to bring it under legal privilege as far as possible. Uh, what did you understand that to mean? Presumably, presumably that something was raised by Simon. Um, but I would presume that to have been included in the central repository. Um, John Scott appeared before this inquiry in phase four, and his evidence was uh, that you wanted things covered by legal professional privilege. Is that correct? I think certainly there was a view from the civil litigation lawyers on the call um, that they wanted to try and protect information by legal privilege. And if you look at some of the early minutes, uh, it's discussed in the, in the call. And you were, at this stage, were you in charge of John Scott's department? I was. Uh, did you therefore give him a direction that things should be covered by legal privilege as far as possible? No, I left that to the civil litigation lawyers that were on the call. Um, he certainly seems to think in this email that it was you who gave that order. I, I I'm not, I wouldn't, I don't think I would have done. Um, putting a potential horizon glitch uh, under legal privilege so far as possible, that, that's very significant, isn't it? It certainly seems so, yes. If we carry on, the next paragraph ends as follows. However, the nature of the operating under the radar and with my memory fading of the rationale, from Martin's perspective, it would look disorganized without formal terms of reference, electronic notes, action lists, etc. Um, was this a group that was meant to be operating under the radar? Not as far as I was concerned, because there's an email from Roderick setting up the group and it clearly states that who needs to be on the calls? We've got two lawyers from external firms. And it absolutely wasn't operating under the radar in that respect. Uh, he ends as follows. Clearly, I will now attend the conference calls as chair and following on from the previous discussions and the steer below, unless otherwise directed, uh, this will become a formal meeting with terms of reference, electronic notes, actions, and appropriate governance within such uh, approach. This will be built into the operating and governance model, and the previous notes and actions over the last three will now be electronically recorded and circulated. Uh, this does run the risk that more communication will be generated electronically with issues, reports, and actions responded to, etc., uh, that may include inappropriate comments, opinion, assumptions that may be subject to the Freedom of Information Act and disclosure, as in the Helen Rose report. Um, this correspondence with John Scott is occurring around the same time as uh, the CEO is complaining about bland board papers. Uh, were you at this time seeking to not include certain information provided to the board uh, and to keep information uh, under legal privilege so far as possible? No, I don't, that's not my recollection. Let's look at the response to Andy Cash. That's poll 00006797. We're on the 16th of August, 2013. I think we heard from Roderick Williams that he drafted this response. Do you recall that? Yes, he, I saw that, yes. Uh, was that your recollection? Yes. Yes, it is my recollection. It says, thank you for your letter of the 2nd of August 2013, enclosing Simon Clark's advice on disclosure. Uh, unfortunately, I had not seen your letter and was not aware of it until Martin's email on the 14th of August. So that was the evidence that you've just been giving about potentially not having seen it. That's um, correct, yes. But that may or may not be correct. You're not sure. So I think, so I thought it was a telephone call with Martin, but maybe it was an email saying, have you got this letter? I don't know. But I think it was the time that Hugh was away. So it might well have come into him because he was first on the envelope. I'm, but I'm speculating. There is a suggestion in the evidence that Roderick Williams had kept it in a drawer. Uh, what's your recollection of that? I think, I guess can't specifically recollect it, but it might be correct because we were so 
busy and because Hugh was away. And I think also Roderick had been on holiday as well. Um, why would it be kept in a drawer if people were away? And the suggestion of a drawer is something slightly covert. I don't know. I really don't know. Do you think that there was an attempt to keep that advice quiet? No, I don't think so. Uh, the advice was prepared as a consequence of statements purportedly made in connection with the weekly conference calls uh, we established to share across the post office limited issues identified with the Horizon system. A key purpose of the Horizon calls is to ensure Horizon users are promptly made aware of any issues with it so that these issues can be effectively managed. In the next paragraph, I'm therefore deeply concerned at the suggestion in Simon's note that there may have been an attempt to destroy documentary material generated in connection with the Horizon calls, specifically any minutes of the calls. I note Simon's advice does not suggest that material connected to the operation of Horizon itself may have been compromised. Post Office Limited is committed to conducting its business in an open, transparent and lawful manner. Any suggestion to the contrary would not reflect Post Office Limited's policy and would not be authorised or endorsed by Post Office Limited. Accordingly, the purported statements referred to in Simon's note do not reflect or represent Post Office Limited's position. Um, that's not true, is it? In what sense? Well, we've seen the email correspondence from John Scott saying that that was exactly the kind of thing that he was doing intentionally. Um, do you think it was fair or accurate to say the purported statements referred to in Simon's notes do not reflect or represent Post Office Limited's position when you had been told by John Scott on the 14th of August that he thought that this was an under-the-radar group uh, that didn't want any electronic communications? I... I'm just trying to remember the order of things. Um, I, I think that what happened was that I went and asked Janelle what had, what had happened and why this had come to the fore. But I think, I think that was before this had come in. But I also don't recollect, recollect having that conversation with John. I just know that Roderick sent the email to set the, um, the group up. There was some discussion in one of the first sets of minutes about privilege. Um, I don't recollect either asking John Scott if he shredded documents or not, which I would have done had I seen the information before that email had come in. So I'm, I'm just really a bit confused about the chronology. I can assist you with the chronology. The chronology is 13th of August, you send an email to John Scott, uh, asking, saying that you've had some worrying feedback from Cartwright King. Uh, on the 14th of August, John Scott responds to you, uh, saying that, referring to the under the radar escalation point, um, and, and saying that you didn't want any electronic communication. Uh, and then on the 16th of August, you send a letter to Andy Cash at Cartwright King making no mention uh, of any confusion within the business as to whether electronic records should be kept, uh, but instead referring to purported statements in Simon's notes, which don't reflect or represent Post Office Limited's position. That, that's the chronology, isn't it? I think that's right, yes. yes. Uh, and why would you not be full and frank with your own lawyers uh, as to the contents of John Scott's very recent admission in his email to you? I think I was being, trying to be full and frank because I think it was the intention, um, my intention, that we set up this hub, we ran this properly, there were minutes, notes, and it was run from a central you know, file so that people would have access to it. I didn't intend for it to be under the radar in that sense. No, but you had been told very brief, very shortly before you sent this email, that the person who was meant to be chairing it saw it as precisely that. Yes, I should have put those two things together. Uh, and why weren't you full and frank with your own lawyers in that respect?
I think I was. I think we, the post office was committed to running that hub in the way that I've set out. I think there have been some issues with regard to operationalising that, um, which were obviously very significant. Is there a missing paragraph in this letter that should have said, oh, and by the way, we have a, a rogue employee uh, who totally misunderstood the brief? I think if there's some correspondence or there's some copy documents I've seen which seems to indicate that, and it, it goes to the cultural point about, about post office, which is raised, I can't remember which, um, which note it is, saying that people don't want this to be recorded, whereas that was not my view, that was not my stance. Having received Simon Clarke's advice, did you press John Scott any further as to whether anything had been shredded? I can't recollect that. The note in that advice about shredding, uh, would that, in your view, be consistent with John Scott's email to you of the 14th of August? No, it wouldn't, but it would be consistent, I think, with the type of thing that John L. had brought, John L. Singh had brought to my attention with regard to the confusion of the calls and what the purpose was and how we could get the, the um, items, the, the issues nailed down and properly described and moved forward. As general counsel of the post office at this time, what investigation did you carry out into those very serious allegations that had been made in that Simon Clark advice? So uh, my recollection was that I uh, certainly went and spoke to uh, Mr Singh because he was on the call. I also think I spoke to Andy Parsons and possibly I'd obviously spoken to Simon, to Martin Smith, and I think I asked John Scott, but I can't remember when. I mean, it might be suggested by some in the room that by the summer of 2013, you had now effectively drunk the corporate Kool-Aid and were worrying about having given Second Sight too much information. What would you say to that suggestion? No, I don't agree with that. Did you, by that stage, feel responsible for the damage that Second Sight was said to have done to the business? No, I, I felt responsible, I suppose, for Alice saying she was blindsided, Alice Perkins was saying she was blindsided at the board, but I didn't, on reflection, after I didn't consider that to be the case. Is that a convenient moment for our afternoon break? Then? That is, uh, yes. Thank you very much. Could we come back uh, in 10 minutes' time? Yeah. Thank you very much. So, so that I'm clear 25 that past. 25 past, yeah. Fine. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Crichton. We're going to stick with August 2013 and just look at some other developments that occurred at that time. Can we bring up onto screen poll 00116218, please? I'm going to start on page two. Bottom of page two. Thank you. Can we have a look at the very bottom email, please, and over to the next page. 27th of August, Alwyn Lyons emails Paul of Ennels a draft note for the board. Um, and it says as follows, Paula, I think this is here, uh, is the message for the board. Can you let me have any amends? Would you look in particular at the HR piece, uh, as these are my words, but you may want to change them. If we scroll down, we can see... Um, Horizon announcement of independent mediation scheme for sub-postmasters, Project Sparrow. We have today announced the introduction of an independent mediation scheme to address the concerns raised by some sub-postmasters regarding cases that they feel require further resolution. It says the Post Office, Justice for Sub-Postmasters Alliance and Second Sight uh, have formed a working group to collaboratively develop and monitor this scheme which is available to current and former sub-postmasters from the 27th of August 2013. Uh, so we have, b 
by now the 27th of August established uh, the mediation scheme and the working group. Um, if we scroll up, please, there's an email responding to this from Paula Venels um, to Alwyn Lyons and yourself. And she says, Alwyn, thank you for this. I'll get back to you on one section I'm reviewing, but wanted to get Susan in the loop on Horizon as soon as possible. She says, re-Horizon, I think there's too much detail regarding the release, but nothing on reassuring the board regarding mediation. They will want to know how we plan to manage any associated risk. Susan, a couple of questions to help position this. I've just read the mediation pack tonight. Page 10 states clearly that compensation can be a possible outcome. When we discussed this, the hope of mediation was to avoid or minimize compensation, but as far as I can see, the pack doesn't really suggest any other outcome. Difficult to do, I know. And so uh, this will be the page that sub-postmasters will pay attention to. You explained uh, that there were steps in place to advise sub-postmasters entering the process, that this was a chance to be heard and not to expect compensation. However, are we planning to manage those expectations and where compensation may be offered? You mentioned small figures in the three to five thousand pound band. Uh, can we give a range of costs? Um, was that your understanding of the mediation scheme? In the sense of compensation? Um, well, Paula Venels gives the impression in this email that the hope of mediation was to avoid or minimize compensation, um, and that if there was to be compensation, it would be only small figures. So I think my view, my, my recollection at the time was that compensation could easily be one of the outcomes, and we wouldn't know what level it would be. I mean, there is some um, documentation which looks at the things like compensation for I can't remember now, loss of contract or something. Um, and there is some mention somewhere of those kind of figures, but we wouldn't actually know until we'd started the scheme. Uh, and from your recollection uh, in relation to this email and general conversations that were had at the time, uh, was the business at that stage a little concerned about what the, the, the result of the mediation scheme could possibly be? Yes, I think it probably was. Um, can we turn to poll 00194465? Just very quickly want to go to that bottom email. It seems that by the 29th of August, this is an email from Chris Day to Alice Perkins, you're copied in. Uh, I've discussed this with Susan and asked her to negotiate a monthly cap of £25,000 with Second Sight. Uh, in addition, Second Sight have agreed to transition out, uh, subject to our in-house team being sufficiently competent slash independent in both carrying on with existing investigations and supporting sub-postmasters appropriately over the coming months, uh, depending on the incidence of new cases arising and the rate of take-up. Um, over the page, please. Susan's view uh, is that this is likely to be achievable by the end of this calendar year or latest first quarter of 2014. Um, so it seems as though by this stage, second sight were being transitioned out of the picture. The, the, what was going to happen, the way the mediation scheme was going to work from memory, is that they would be part of the mediation scheme and they would look at the sub postmaster's cases to make sure that there was enough information there for mediation or they would be sitting in that central hub there so uh, it was a tr it was transparent in that respect they were still going to be part of the mediation scheme and I think on my part that was absolutely a best guess as to how long it would take to do that we didn't know we hadn't started looking back at all of those emails that we've seen this afternoon and this morning uh, do you think that the post office was genuine in wanting to get to the bottom of the problems with Horizon? I felt I was genuine. 
and I thought you might ask me about the mediation scheme, so I've reflected on that. I know that I was genuine in my attempt to set it up in a way I believed would work and would work for sub-postmasters. I'm really not sure what the post office wanted from that at that stage. Um, do you think that the executive team really wanted an independent investigation? In, in 2012? Yes. I know that I thought it was the right thing to do. I don't know about other people on the executive team. I, I, you know, I can reflect and say, well, maybe they didn't, um, but I don't know. I don't know. The picture that's painted by some of those emails that we've been looking at is that when things suddenly weren't going the post office's way in that independent inquiry, uh, it seems that there was an attempt to cover that up in some way by using legal professional privilege, bland board statements, uh, using words other than bugs. Um, do you agree with that? That was not my intention at the time, from my recollection. Uh, and how about the intention of others? I can't speak for other people. I really can't. Well, well let's look at a file note um, from Paula Venels, Paul 00381629. This is a file note that's very recently been disclosed by the post office. I think you may have had it only yesterday. Um, it starts, it says Friday the 30th of September, and 30th of September was actually a Monday, and it looks from the context of this document likely to have been the 30th of August, because we then scroll down and we can see uh, a meeting on the 2nd of September. Uh, that, I think it must have been the 30th of August. 30th of August. Um, I'm going to take you through, as I have those other file notes, quite slowly and carefully. Um, purpose. Susan had asked me earlier in the week how I felt about her continuing in the business and what job I was expecting her to do. Um, I was slightly surprised that she had raised the issue again. We had already had a conversation where I said... I had wanted her to um, help her to restore her reputation after the board discussion. But again, I said I wanted her to do what I had asked of her prior to my holiday, i.e. to get on top of the new processes, uh, to lead the business through the mediation scheme, and to help me use this as a catalyst to change the culture. Uh, so we listened more. Um, so that's a, a reference to the board discussion of the 16th of July of 2013. I assume so. Yes. Did you understand that to be the purpose? I, I have to say I can't remember this meeting. Um, so it, I just can't remember it at all. Um, it says, Susan was very, very angry. She yelled at me. She thinks this has damaged her reputation. She was upset that Alice had commissioned the RH review. Is that the Richard Hatfield review? I think it must be, yes. Uh, and that was a further review that was going to be a lessons learned exercise, is that That's right? That's correct. Um, now, you may not be able to recollect this meeting, but can you recall not being happy with the commissioning of the lessons learned review? I, I was not, no. I felt, it was, um, I felt it was an inappropriate use of funds, if you like. Um, I thought we should get on and get the mediation scheme going. Um, and why would it be an inappropriate use of funds? Because it was just going back over old ground again. She was cross that I hadn't got her the terms of reference before I circulated it to Alice, Alistair and RH, that's Richard Hatfield. Uh, she was convinced there was a breakdown of trust, especially between her and Alice, uh, but with the board generally. Although she did say that all the board except Susanna had been in touch... Um, I mean, we, we've seen previously the reference to you being worried that you were going to be a scapegoat. Is this in a similar vein? Yes, I think so. Um, Susanna, is that Susanna's story? Is that the Shex representative? Yes. 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 Um, would it 
have surprised you that she hadn't been in touch, or are we not to read anything into that? Not really. I mean, I also I think they hadn't necessarily all been in touch. They sort of might have sent an email or popped into the office or something. Uh, I explained I had simply not the time to give her the terms of reference. Uh, Dave Ward, cool slash CWU, Communications and Workers Union, a discussion with CD slash KG. Uh, are you able to assist us with that? I'm guessing it would be, oh, Chris Day and Kevin Gilliland. Um, I said, if she felt some changes were needed, then I would be happy to consider them. Uh, she suggested that our external lawyers, Bond Dickinson, should be involved. I said, if that helped, I couldn't see why not and would think about it. Um, now, she said, I explained I had simply not the time to give her the terms of reference. Do you think that that was true? On reflection, no. And why not? Because it would only have, have meant sending, forwarding an email. It is clear that the RH review has destabilised her. Uh, she shouted that she was looking at other jobs. She threatened uh, that we would have to back her, implying the importance of references. Uh, she again raised that Alice had made mistakes. I reminded her that we probably all had, and Alice had accepted that Richard Hatfield needed to be even-handed. I reminded her again that I had raised with Alice the issue of Alice also needing to be interviewed. And I said that whilst I would be asking Alice about a couple of challenges Susan raised, Alice believing Donald and Biz comments about post office cover-up, question mark, I wanted to be loyal to the chairman as I believe she had imagined the Richard Hatfield review uh, would be a way of moving on. Um, there's quite a lot to unpack in that paragraph. Can we begin by um, looking at the issue between you and Alice Perkins? I mean, did you feel that the review was in some way Alice Perkins setting you up? I think that's what I thought at the time. That, that would be my recollection, yes. And Alice believing Donald and Biz comments about post office cover up. Can you assist us? I can't remember that. I mean, it's quite important for the for this. I, I, I absolutely understand. And the problem I have is that I can't remember this meeting at all. Um, I'm sure you know it's written contemporaneously, as you've said, with other things. So I'm I'm sure it must have happened, but it's so far out of my normal range of behaviour the shouting and the, um, especially in a public place, well, anyway, but I, I just can't remember it. Um, then says, I also wanted to see if we could get ourselves back on an even keel. Susan is clearly making lawyers' notes on everything, and I would like the two of them to repair their relationship. I'm not sure how doable the latter is, but to have it break down totally at present is not in anyone's interests. So I mostly listened and took the anger. Eventually she calmed down and I said I would genuinely like to help her find a way through this. She began to be positive again. Uh, and as we walked back to 148, is, it, is that the post office building? Yes. Uh, Susan suggested I join her and her HR team for her moving on supper. I thanked her and said I would be happy to do that and to say how sorry I was that it had happened so quickly, uh, and she had helped me make the function much stronger, and I was grateful to her. Um, at that point, is that moving on from just from the HR team, not from the whole business, or was that moving That was on? just moving on from the HR team. Um, if we go over the page, please. There seems to be another meeting on Monday, the 2nd of September, 2013. Um, there was another note, sorry, of that date. And she says as follows, over the weekend I reflected that Susan's request to bring in BD, I think that's Bond Dickinson, is that your reading of it? Yes, it yeah. is. Um, was more about her lack of confidence and decided to reassure her that I was happy to take her opinions to demonstrate confidence in her. Um, then says, Susan then told me... Um, it didn't matter because she couldn't do her job anymore. 
Just pausing there. Was there, a, there was a second meeting, was there, on the Monday? I'm fine. I found this note really quite confusing. I couldn't work out with, with whether what was reflection and what was the meeting. I, I recollect that with, with my, um, my view at the time, and it was becoming into sharper focus that I could no longer do my time, no longer go t continue in my role at the post office if I didn't have the trust and confidence of the chair, the board and the CEO. We saw that on the first page it was a meeting at Costa Coffee, Old Street. Here it says meeting room 3pm, so it does look as though there was a further meeting on the Monday. Did you say it does look? It, it does look. Yes, I think that's right. It does look like that. Um, Susan told me that it didn't matter because she couldn't do her job anymore. Uh, the RH review was not the right action for the business. We had ruined her reputation and compromised her. Professionally, she needed to point out that the RH review shouldn't happen, as not being legally privileged, it could be detrimental to the business. But Alice would not believe her and instead see her view as defensive. Uh, therefore, uh, she could no longer be effective. A general counsel cannot operate if they don't have the confidence of the chairman, board, CEO. I repeated, she had my confidence and I cited other business issues in the last several days where I had sought her counsel. I'm trying to help her repair the situation. As she pointed to the impossibility of her ever coming before the board. I disagreed. Uh, she would have spoken to all of the board and I reminded her that Alice wanted an open and even handed RH lesson learned review. Um, we saw that that earlier board meeting, you hadn't been allowed into the room or hadn't been uh, invited into the room. Um, did you think that from that point onwards, it was or was not uh, possible for you to effectively um, attend board meetings? I suppose I came to the conclusion or the realisation it's, it's something you never ex I never expected to happen to me. And it took me some time to adjust to what had happened and understand it. And it's sort of clear to me um, that I, I was just, um, I felt I couldn't continue in my role. And I think that was further exacerbated by um, the way that the responsibility from HR had been removed from me. Now I agree that was the right thing to do for the business, but it was the way it had been done. Um, so I think mentally I was in a bad place, I think I can say. The suggestion in that paragraph might be that um, Alice Perkins thought that you didn't want to be scrutinised by the Lessons Learned Review. Uh, was that your understanding of, of hers or Paula Venels' position? No, I don't think so. No. Yeah, um, could we scroll down, please? Uh, she says as follows, I wonder if Susan is overreacting to the review, uh, but she could be right. She will undoubtedly make the legal case against it. Emotionally, she may just throw in the towel if we decide to press ahead. This may also be her way of saying she can't cope with much more pressure at present. Uh, if Susan leaves in the short term, that will be a major setback. She has stabilised the project, which is demonstrating that she wants to right the wrongs not my word, uh, my words, not hers. Uh, and importantly, the external stakeholders have responded positively and she has the confidence of the internal team. Um, she says not your words, but hers in terms of right the wrongs. Um, what did you understand that to be a reference to? I think she's referring to the fact that's how she felt about the, the second site review uh, and my handling of the second site review. Could we scroll down, please? I need to find a way of calming this down and buying us some time to think carefully. We can do a lessons learned internally, and if we do it ourselves, then there could be some reconciliation. How we handle this will say a great deal about the values of the business. And then she provides some further reflections. She says, in both meetings, Susan was very emotional. Uh, she's hurt, her ego and self-esteem have been undermined. She swings between wanting to get away from it all 
uh, with a settlement and leave immediately uh, to building the case to fight and to defend her reputation to accepting that the most satisfactory outcome would be to restore her reputation by managing the mediation scheme through to a satisfactory ongoing process. Um, just pausing there. Uh, is, is she right there? Is that a fair reading of your feelings at that time? Reading this back, because um, it is, is quite a blur, it probably is, but I really can't remember specifically. Um, there's, you know, I'd been a, a lawyer for a long time, then I'd worked in a number of different companies. I never expected to find myself in this position. Uh, each time we finished the meeting positively, Susan had said to me prior to my leave that she would never have put a business she worked for in the situation we found ourselves with Second Sight Interim Report, and she wished she had never allowed Alice to persuade her to do the independent review. Uh, she should, in her view, have resigned over it at the time. Uh, that suggests that you regretted getting Second Sight involved. I didn't regret getting Second Sight involved. I think what I, reg what I regretted is that I hadn't been clear if it was appropriate about my role in the second site review and what I, what I meant by being independent. Uh, we've seen some evidence uh, and some documents that refer to effectively you convincing Alice Perkins to do the independent review and here we have the suggestion that in fact it was the other way around. I think Alice was driving the independent review and I think in her notes you see her initial intention that, 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 that the MPs' cases should be reviewed, but that gradually cooling as we go through the process. Uh, and what, do you, what reasons do you think uh, there were for that cooling? The length of time, so practical, I think, the length of time it was taking, the cost it was taking, and the fact that she considered I wasn't controlling it appropriately. Uh, and what about the damaging things that Second Sight had discovered uh, relating to... The horizon. Yes, obviously, they would be included as well. My reflection on what happened with Second Sight as I write this today, at the 2nd of September, is that Susan was possibly more loyal to her professional conduct requirements and put her integrity as a lawyer above the interests of the business. She did not communicate clearly what she was concerned about, uh, if, as she says, she felt compromised personally and for the business by being asked to manage Second Sight more closely, then her misjudgment was that she did not make that clearer to me on the two or three occasions that I asked her to do so. Um, do you agree with what's said there? Yes, uh, well, uh, as I say, I can't remember this conversation. Oh, it's her reflection, isn't it? So... It this wasn't a conversation that we had. This is her thinking about it afterwards. Yes. So w was, for example, uh, managing Second Sight more closely, did you, did you see that as in some way conf in conflict with your role as a lawyer? I, I think what I would have said was that I wanted to ensure that their report was independent and I wouldn't try and control them in a way that didn't give them access or ability to write the report in their way, provided it was evidence-based. Um, reference there to putting your integrity as a lawyer above the interests of the business. What did you see your role as in terms of being general counsel? Um, was it uh, integrity as a lawyer or was it interest of the business? Were they in conflict? I had never had experienced a situation where my integrity as a lawyer was in conflict with the business that I worked for. Um, I, I was just very focused on delivering the independent report from Second Sight. So if that meant that I put my integrity as a lawyer above the interest of the business, then possibly that's what I did. I didn't see it quite in that way at the time. Susan believes the person who compromised her is Alice. Uh, Alice met James Arbuthnot partway through the review, and according to Susan, Alice agreed with James Arbuthnot that Second Sight had to keep the JFSA happy. 
Uh, Susan believed that an independent review meant that she could not, would not then intervene to change the biased opinions that Second Sight reached because they were keeping the JFSA happy. It took some strong persuasion for Susan to accept, which I'm clear she did, as she was disappointed with it, that the first interim report needed Second Sight to amend it. The board and the external stakeholders only saw the second version. Can you assist us with your views on that? So my recollection is that um, when I got the first version of the Second Sight report, which hasn't appeared in any of the documents, that some of the, um, the flavour of the report was not focused on the evidence, but rather focused on um, a somewhat emotional uh, interpretation of the facts. And this was when I had the discussion with Second Sight to say, you know, what you write needs to be evidence-based and needs to be put in those terms. Um, but we had a discussion about it. I wouldn't have been able to force them to do that, but we just had an exchange of views. Can we scroll down, please? Wider performance context. Up until this time, Susan had been a wise, if risk-averse, uh, we had discussed this, general counsel. Uh, she worked long hours and professionally for the business, steering the post office through the MDA and MSA uh, during their separation from Royal Mail. Um, it says, if risk-averse, we had discussed this. Can you recall a conversation with Paula Venels about you being risk-averse? No, I can't. And I, I wondered if... Well, that no. could be a discussion with somebody else, perhaps? Or? I wonder if she discussed it with Alice. I don't know. Um, it says further down, she agreed that she would relinquish the HR function. Um, when we were faced with the urgency of handling the second site interim review, fallout, a ministerial statement to Parliament, high-profile media, etc., I told Susan that I was minded to implement that decision immediately so that she could concentrate on second site handling. Uh, Faye would take on the HR reporting in the interim. Susan agreed. Uh, HR announcement. When I returned from holiday, I was told by Alwyn that Susan had been upset because I had not spoken to her about the timing of the announcement. Uh, she indicated uh, that she that could be construed as constructive dismissal, uh, but then I qualif then qualified her comments by confirming she did not know and had not been involved twice in the decision-making process. Is this related to uh, you relinquishing the HR role? Correct. Yes. And, and what's your recollection of that? So I don't remember discussing it twice. Uh, in, re in retrospect, with hindsight, it was absolutely the right thing to do. Just the HR made that, the addition made that job very difficult to do. Can we please look at poll 00381658? Before, before we look at that other document, what are your general reflections on, on this note, having now seen it and going through it? Um, I find it quite shocking um, that I got into that kind of situation. So as a pers as per personal reflection, it's quite... Um, it's quite... Uh, distressing, I think. Um, I must have been in a really bad state. And does it give you any insight into how the company was run at the time? So, if I put myself in Paula's position, and I have been in this position with people I've worked with and for over the years, I would have packed myself up on a, on a month's sick leave and said, don't come back till you feel better and have got things in perspective. Uh, and did that happen? No. I mean, I don't know whether you're going to go on to it, but shortly after this, I, I had already taken some legal advice and I uh, gave Paula Venels a um, without prejudice letter, which set out the terms on which I would agree the settle a settlement to um, leave Paul. And I left Paul effectively at the end of September as we went on holiday. I came back in for a day or so in October. Um, and then I was on gardening leave in November. Can we look at poll 00381658, please? This is a, an email exchange between Paula Venels and Alice Perkins of the 7th of September 2013. <coughs> so the month that, that 
you've said you, you effectively left. Um, she says, my approach needs to remind Alistair, uh, who, who was Alistair, sorry? I think that's Alistair Marnett, the chair of the ARC. Um, where we left off, then paint the story uh, to arrive at the conclusion carefully, especially as the last time we spoke, I'd been in the place of trying to help Susan repair the damage. Uh, so that will be a change. I think he will understand. Alistair had raised a couple of questions regarding Susan's judgment, uh, but less than others. Uh, regarding speaking to Susan, I had a tip-off from Alwyn that Susan may raise it with me on Monday herself. Uh, they spoke midweek. Susan said it was making her ill, uh, and she didn't see how she could, could continue having lost the confidence of the board. And it says exactly the same conclusions, although that makes it slightly easier. Uh, if she does raise it, uh, people can change their minds, not tidy. So I shall wait and see what happens. Either way, assuming Susan is in 148, uh, we will have the conversation on Monday. I'm speaking to Faye this weekend, uh, as we'll need to be thinking about which lawyers we use, interim cover, and about business messages. And indeed, when Susan goes, it sounds as though she wants that to be straight away. Uh, much will depend on Susan's state of mind. I have been in situations like this where people have been helpful and suggested the best outcomes themselves. Susan is capable of doing that, but I'm not holding my breath. I hope this sounds calm. I am uh, on the outside, on the inside. Uh, it was never going to be easy, but it's nothing to do with what Susan's going through, nothing to what Susan is going through, irrespective of what caused it. Uh, thank you for your support and helpful questions are always welcome. Um, irrespective of what had caused it, I mean, did you believe Paula Venels to have understood your reasons for leaving? No, I don't think she did. Uh, and why not? I don't think she understood um, my point about the, this has to be an independent review. We can't manage it or manipulate it in the way that possibly Alice was expecting me to do. And this is all supposition on my part. Um, and uh, either way, I had decided that the time was to draw a close to this, to this chapter in my career. Can we please look at UKGI 00007316? These are key points from a second site meeting that relate to after your time. Um, it says as follows, interesting snippets include uh, Ron Warmington used to work with former uh, poll general counsel Susan Crichton at GE. Uh, that's how they were introduced to James Arbuthnot. Uh, second site link the change in approach by the post office to Crichton's departure in November 2013, according to LinkedIn. A uh, slight dig at how the post office are on their third or fourth general council since Crichton left. In Henderson, worked for the CCERC for four years, so they take a very narrow and technical view of miscarriages of justice. Were you aware, um, I know you weren't working in the business, but of any, or any change of approach of the post office after you had left? No. Did you have any discussions with uh, Second Sight, for example, after no. you had left? No, I don't. I don't think, no, I don't think I've, no, I don't think so. Looking at the way things are going, were going when you did leave, do you think it was likely or unlikely that the post office would become more restrictive towards second sight? I suppose reflecting on, on the discussions today that they would become uh, more restrictive, although I, I hoped, I genuinely really hoped that the mediation scheme might move the process forward. Um, so I have a number of miscellaneous topics to move on to. Um, it's been quite a long day today. I, I'm in your hands. We have plenty of time tomorrow. I, I can either um, start on those topics. Mr. Blake, if you're trying to persuade me that after a long, hard day, we should stop now, then you needn't say any more. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I'm sorry, um, Ms. Crichton, that 
Um, you'll have to come back tomorrow. I'm grateful for you to agreeing to do that. These are arduous sessions, and in making the observation, which I did, about um, Mr. Blake doesn't need to persuade me any further, rest assured I've had regard for, for you as well, and although I have no doubt that you want this over as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible, um, there's a limit to how many questions you can reasonably ask the field in one day, and you've fielded a good many. So I think it's time to stop, all right? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Mrs. Crichton is a lawyer and will have well in mind the prohibitions on speaking. Yes, I'm sure, sure she will. I should think it's the last thing that she'll want to do is to talk about this. Um, but if you do get tempted to talk about it, Ms. Crichton, resist the temptation. Thank you, sir. Um, we're it's back at 9.45 9 tomorrow. 9.45, and I'm reminded that there will be a fire test, as usual, on a Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. So I simply propose that um, if you're still asking questions, as I assume you may be at that point, Mr. Blake, you simply stop very shortly before 10, and we just all sit quietly through the fire alarm and then start again. Yes, that, that's correct, sir. Fine. Yes. Um, so I, I'm reminded by uh, Mr. Wallace that today is three years since the quashing of the convictions. Uh, no, yeah. doubt, no doubt that those present will be marking that today. Well, I have no doubt that um, as each year goes by, never mind three years, that will be something which is always embedded in the minds of very many people. All right, see you tomorrow. Thank you very much.